set of questions, and then we'll take it from there. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mohammed. I'm one of the uh, cardiac imaging attendings. And uh, no disclosures, but I do echo, CT, and MRI. But today is going to be echo 101. So we're going to um, walk you guys through what you really need to know for echo standpoint. So the first question here, this is our pretest questionnaire. So which is the least accurate regarding the interaction of ultrasound in tissue? The shorter the wavelength, the smaller the structure that can be accurately resolved. Who thinks that this is accurate or not? Okay. The higher the frequency of the ultrasound, the higher the spatial resolution. Okay, a lot of people are nodding. Okay, the lower the frequency of the ultrasound, the higher the tissue penetration. Okay, so people agree that this is accurate. And then attenuation always increases with depth regardless of the frequency or tissue type. True or not? Okay, so people are saying this is the least accurate. Okay, we'll find out. And the other question is, which of the following is true? The Doppler shift frequency only depends on the original frequency of ultrasound, velocity, or uh, ultrasound through the medium and velocity of the reflector? We think it's true or not? Okay, people are saying not true. Continuous wave Doppler allows you to monitor the depth of your target. True or untrue? Okay, and then color Doppler is based on pulse wave Doppler. True or false? True, okay. Well, um, today's objective on this lecture, we're gonna talk about touch on the basic physics, uh, echocardiogram, like if you're gonna be using any instrument, you really need to read the, uh, the instructions manual. <laughs> so before you start reading echoes and doing echocardiograms, you wanna know what you're dealing with. So we're gonna be touching upon uh, frequency and wavelength, uh, resolution, display presentation, and then most importantly, the Doppler equation, and then we'll basically finish with some standard echo views. So um, as you're all familiar with, ultrasound is basically a series of waves that are sinusoidal, and they basically undergo rarefaction and compression, and it basically has an amplitude, and it also has a wavelength. And by definition, uh, whenever we're talking about uh, uh, frequency, frequency is going to be the number of those oscillations or cycles per second. So you can see here the interval between one uh, um, um, wave to the other is a cycle. So whenever I'm talking about the frequency of the ultrasound is going to be the number of those cycles per second. And as we know, that ultrasound tends to propagate within medium after uh, um, in a different speed. So this is very important, which is the velocity of sound uh, in different tissues. So whenever we're doing cardiac examination, the ultrasound waves is traveling through soft tissue. And this is a very important number that we have to know. 1.54 meters per second is the velocity of ultrasound in tissue. But we can see that in air, it doesn't really go as fast. And then with bone, ultrasound basically goes really high. So this is very unique for ultrasound, that it has different velocities for different tissues that is being imaged. So the other important equation we need to know is from frequency and wavelength, how do I get a velocity? So by definition, velocity equals frequency multiplied by wavelength. So let's take an ultrasound transducer. Say it's a three megahertz uh, ultrasound transducer. So this is three million cycles per second. And I already know what the speed of ultrasound in the tissue that I'm um, uh, imaging, which is the soft tissue, is 1.54. So if I want to know what is the wavelength of the ultrasound that I am sending uh, during this, uh, um, uh, using this transducer, all what I need to do is basically divide the velocity, which is 1.54, divided by the frequency, which is 3 megahertz or 3, 000, uh, 3 million cycles per second, and you're going to get the wavelength here of 0.5 millimeter. So basically, wavelength in millimeter is 1.54, which is the speed, divided by the frequency and megahertz. So this is another fundamental concept that we need to know uh, uh, in cardiac ultrasound. So as we talked about, the frequency is going to be the number of cycles per second, and it's a property that's very exclusive to the echo probe. And typical frequencies on our ultrasound probes can range anywhere from 2 to 10 megahertz. Uh, the frequency depends on the signal strength and the imaging resolution. So if I'm using a lower frequency ultrasound, that means that my signal is going to be stronger. But unfortunately, lower frequency ultrasounds does not give you a high spatial resolution. So you're going to be sacrificing one thing for the other. So although I have a stronger signal, meaning that it's able to penetrate more 
but unfortunately, my image resolution is gonna be degraded. Now, on the reverse side, if I'm using a higher frequency ultrasound probe, then you're really gonna have much better resolution, but the problem is it doesn't really penetrate further down. So frequency and penetration and resolution, it's a very important uh, one that gets better, the other one unfortunately gets worse, and this is a very fundamental concept also in ultrasound frequency, especially when you wanna pick your ultrasound probe. So this is your typical two-dimensional ultrasound transducer um, that we use on a daily basis. So what is in this? Uh, what's on this head of this ultrasound probe? So what you have is basically a series of piezoelectric crystals. And these piezoelectric crystals that have positive and negative charges, if I apply current through them, then basically it is gonna be changing its configuration. And once it's changes its configuration, then it's gonna actually generate an energy. And this energy is gonna be in the form of ultrasound. So it generates, but at the same time, this probe is also receiving ultrasound waves. So this configuration change in the piezoelectric crystal will both transmit and also be able to receive energy whenever you apply current through it. So this is basically what's in that little head probe that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So echocardiography, the way it's uh, from the, what the name uh, uh, entails is actually you're creating images of the heart from reflecting sound waves. So through this ultrasound probe, you're sending waves and then you're hearing back. And then those reflected waves is how the image is being uh, generated. And what the transducer does, it's actually recording the time that it takes for the ultrasound to travel back and forth and the amplitude for each of those returning transmissions. And if I know the speed of the ultrasound in the medium that are imaging, which is soft tissue is constant, so only the distance of the structure from the probe is the only variable. And this is what's gonna alter the time to receive this reflected wave. And hence, this is how on ultrasound we're able to define the location of the image that we are interested in. Now, when it comes to ultrasound, we have different types of resolution. So when we're looking at axial resolution, I'm actually looking at two structures on top of each other and the axial orientation and how good am I able to discriminate between these two structures? This is what resolution is. And um, this is on the axial axis, but also on ultrasound, we have a lateral resolution by which I have two adjacent structures, but they're not on top of each other, they're next to each other. And that's basically what determines that is a lot of factors. So some of it has to do with the depth of the structure that you're imaging, but also how wide this ultrasound beam is. Because the wider the ultrasound beam, it's gonna make your resolution uh, uh, better. Um, and the temporal resolution is basically, I wanna have an imaging, I wanna image a moving structure. And how good am I able to detect this structure in motion? This is basically what uh, alters your temporal resolution, which has very important role in determining how many frames per second are you imaging, which is basically the sampling rate of an image. So basically the more sampling you are acquiring, I'm gonna be able to discriminate those two moving structures. So like the mitral valve, you wanna image it with a higher frame rate, which basically gives you a better temporal resolution. So these concepts for different types of resolutions are also very important to know, uh, especially when understanding um, um, what you're looking for, but also getting to know what are the limitations of echocardiogram. So if I have an intraatrial septum, for example, here on the axial resolution, unfortunately, because the ultrasound beam is traveling through that, but it's on the y-axis, you're gonna have very limited visualization of that structure because your resolution might be altered uh, by, that by that fact. So if we think about it, if I'm actually have a series and repetitive scanning line, so I'm actually, here's the ultrasound probe, and I'm actually sending packets of ultrasound beams to, and it's actually receiving, and you're actually doing it repetitively and in a very rapid fashion along multiple different radii, and then if you sum up all these ultrasound reflected signals, you're gonna be able to generate an image in the area of interest. So here, here's my sector width, here's my ultrasound probe, here's the apex of the heart, here's the left ventricle, the right ventricle, right atrium, left atrium, and through this multiple scanning lines, you're waiting until you hear back those reflected signals, you're able to generate an image. And the beauty about echocardiogram is that the image is acquired in real time, meaning that you're imaging as the heart is beating, uh, uh, and that's how um, a 2D image is basically displayed on echo. Now, 
going from two-dimensional uh, echo to M mode. So M stands for motion. So what this is, it's actually a single-dimensional view of a moving card deck structure. So if you think about it, here's my ultrasound. Imagine this is your ultrasound uh, uh, probe. There is a single crystal that's actually emitting ultrasound wave, and all what it is doing, it's actually tracking this moving structure in time. So it actually has multiple sampling points, meaning that you're sending, you're receiving, you're sending, you're receiving, and at multiple points, very fast point, you're able to discriminate and the motion of all the tissues in this path of this very narrow ultrasound. So you can see here, the beam is a very narrow and you're basically looking at one single anatomical location, but the display that you're gonna get is a timed motion, meaning that these are for moving structures like valve leaflets or LV myocardium or RV myocardium. Um, one of the disadvantages of the M mode, although it has a very high sampling rate, is the orientation and also the interpretation of the spatial relationships can be difficult because things are moving in time. So if you look at it, here's a, an M mode uh, image. You have a swinging pendulum and all what I'm doing, I have a single line looking at the motion of this pendulum. And you can see here on the uh, representation of this, I'm actually looking at this pendulum as this swinging up and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But remember, it's only a limited scanning line. It doesn't give me spatial relationship to this moving structure. While if I acquire a two-dimensional image by which I have multiple scanning lines, I can actually see this moving structure all the way in space, all the way from the beginning to the end. So this is the difference between a two-dimensional image, which is multiple scanning lines, versus an M mode, which is a motion uh, tracking uh, mode by which you're only looking at it uh, in real-time motion, but at a single anatomical location. Now, the advantages of M-Mode, as we, we always use M-Mode basically in echocardiogram, typically in our personal long axis view, and before 2D, this is how we used to calculate LV mass because I can measure septal wall, I can measure posterior wall. So if you think here, here's the ultrasound probe, here's the, uh, the ultrasound beam, single beam that's crossing through the RV wall, it's crossing through the RV cavity, you have the interventricular septum here, you have the right side of the septum, the left ventricular septum, you have the LV cavity, which is all the way here, and then you also have the mitral valve leaflets. So uh, it has the highest temporal resolution in echocardiogram with sampling rates that can reach up to 1,000, um, which has very high temporal resolution, but unfortunately does not have the uh, sufficient spatial resolution. Now from a 2D image, if I, uh, instead of sending a, a two-dimensional ultrasound beam by which I have an X and a Y axis, and instead I'm actually sending a beam that's basically uh, hearing back but in a three-dimensional display. So if you think about it, each of those uh, pixels, uh, um, if you're able to send a, a, an ultrasound wave that's actually looking at or imaging in three different planes, in an X and a Y and a Z plane, you can actually acquire a slab of volume and that's basically what three-dimensional image is. So you have special probes that are acquiring a volume instead of acquiring single pixels or single two-dimensional structures. And with that pyramid of volume, you're actually able to generate a three-dimensional image. So here's a three-dimensional. Again, it's a real time. So you're actually acquiring as the heart is beating uh, uh, representation of the mitral valve, the anterior leaflet, the posterior leaflet, and here is the aortic valve. So 3D versus 2D, it's a volume instead of a two-dimensional uh, um, uh, pixel size. Now, one thing that we all have to know is the Doppler principle, and uh, Dr. Little always used to uh, hammer me when I was a fellow, because I used to write Doppler with a small d, and Doppler is the, is the family name of Christian Doppler, so it has to be capitalized, so he always used to tell me, show some respect to Doppler. So whenever you're using the Doppler word, it has to be capital D. So this physicist came up with an uh, intriguing observation that still remains valid now almost 200 years after he discovered. And what the Doppler effect is, so imagine you have a moving structure. So let's basically see it here. You have a red blood cells that are moving towards an ultrasound. So what you are doing, you're actually emitting ultrasound waves to this moving structure. But as the structure is moving towards you, you're actually having more reflected ultrasound waves that are coming towards you meaning that the frequency that is you're listening back to is much higher than the frequency you have, you have sent this ultrasound packet to. Now, how about in the other? So these are moving structures, and you're looking at the change in frequency based on how far or how close the structure is moving towards you or away from you. So if I have a red blood cell that's moving away from me, so I'm going to send some ultrasound waves 
But whatever, the signal that I'm going to get back, unfortunately, it's going to have a lower frequency. Why? Because these moving structures are going away from you. So imagine like you're standing in the middle and you have a train coming towards you. So what's happening is that as the train is approaching you, you're having more frequency of, of waves that are hitting your ear and you're able to hear the train coming towards you because of that change in frequency. More frequency is coming towards you, much higher. You're able to hear it, while if the train is moving away from you, your ear will appreciate that, oh, my, the frequency of the, of the sound waves are getting lesser. Why? Because the structure is moving away from you. So what Doppler was able to find out is that I can determine what the velocity of a moving structure is, like blood flow and echo, based on the change in the frequency that happens uh, of the ultrasound that is transmitted and received. So if you think about it, here's the ultrasound probe. It came up with the, uh, the Doppler equation. So I'm actually sending an ultrasound beam, and I'm actually waiting for this ultrasound beam to be reflected back and get a signal. And you have moving red blood cell structures. So what he said is that there is a shift in that frequency, meaning that uh, there is a difference between the transmitted and the reflected frequency that's actually equal to two times the frequency that I have emitted from the ultrasound times the velocity, which V stands for the velocity of the moving structure that you're imaging. An echo, it is red blood cells. And if you multiply that by the cosine, so the angle here is the angle of deflection between this moving structure, which is the red blood cells, which is moving in this direction, and the ultrasound beam. And you divide that by C, which is basically the speed of ultrasound in soft tissue, which is 1.54. So more simply, the frequency shift is going to be proportional to the velocity of the moving structure multiplied by cosine angle intercept between the ultrasound beam and the moving structure. And basically, the faster the moving structure, the larger. Because if I have a much higher velocity, I'm going to have a much larger Doppler effect. And that's what Christian Doppler invented almost 200 years ago. Now, what happens with increasing angle of Doppler? So remember, this cosine uh, um, angle is going to be very important that whatever I'm imaging, and I want to basically sample this, get the frequency shift, I have to be very important to be in parallel to this moving structure. Because I can see, if I'm actually at an angle of zero, cosine of zero is going to be plus one, meaning that I will have perfect Doppler shift and it will be, uh, uh, none of the velocities will be underestimated. But you can see the larger the angle, you're going to have more underestimation of your velocity. It can be as high as 6%, six, 7%, six, here almost 13%. So the larger the angle, if you are imaging off-axis, you're not in parallel with the moving structure, you're basically going to underestimate velocity. That's basically what, what the take-home message is uh, uh, when it, become, when it uh, pertains to the Doppler equation. Do you guys have any questions before we move on to the Bernoulli equation and uh, touch base a little bit on, uh, on more echo basics? Any questions so far? I feel like the crowd is very quiet. We want it to be interactive and we want it to engage you guys. So any questions, feel free to stop me and um, please make it informal. So the second concept of echo is basically Bernoulli's equation. So what Bernoulli actually said that if I have a a chamber, so I have blood or any flow that's basically going from a originating chamber and that's basically going to another chamber. And then there is some sort of uh, um, uh, mechanism by which it's actually causing this velocity to go up. So say for example, I have some narrowing in this hose or this chamber. And what's gonna happen is that I have a certain pressure and a certain velocity at this originating chamber where the blood is moving but then the blood or the fluid is going to move on to another chamber, but I have an area of some sort of narrowing here that's causing the velocity to accelerate. But what happens with the acceleration of velocity is that your pressure will start to drop. So what he actually invented is basically his equation saying, okay, I want to be able to measure the pressure difference between the P1, which is the originating chamber, and P2, which is the receiving chamber. So what he actually took into account is that there is a convective acceleration, which is this acceleration of velocity, but there is also other factors like the viscous fraction and the flow acceleration, which are complicated mathematical equations, and this is the original formula. But what we end up doing is that, what if we assume that the velocity here is less than a meters per second and the P1 is negligible? So what I'm going to basically say that, okay, if I have an acceleration of velocity here and I square that velocity, so my velocity is squared and I multiply that by four, which is basically a summation of uh, um, the convective acceleration, then that I'm able to translate velocity 
into pressure gradient. And that's basically what he came up with, which is basically we use it every day in the Equilab. So what examples do we use the Bernoulli equation in the Equilab for from first year fellows? Okay, exactly. So you have an originating chamber, which is the RV, you have the receiving chamber, which is the RA, and then you have a flow coming in through this valve, which is the tricuspid valve. So if I estimate that P1 and V1 is negligible, what I'm gonna see is what is my, I wanna know the pressure difference between the RV and the RA. So the way I do that, I basically look at the tracings for the tricuspid regurgitation jet, and then with that, if I apply my four V square, which is gonna be V2, because we said that V1 is probably gonna be negligible, so we're only looking at the velocity as it empties into the right atrium, which is the receiving chamber, and that's a great example for uh, using the simplified Bernoulli equation. What he did is, using velocities, we're able to determine pressure gradient across two chambers. Now, also, um, aortic stenosis is another great example. So if you have an aortic valve that's widely open, you're going to have a nice, very flat profile. But if you have uh, aortic stenosis causing turbulence of jets, you're going to have much acceleration of velocity, and the pressures are going to drop down. So what we typically do with echocardiogram is basically we sample a, a velocity across the aortic valve, which you can see here. And then the peak velocity here, we're getting 4.5. So if I want to know what is the pressure difference across this aortic valve, I'm going to use my simplified Bernoulli equation. So I'm going to multiply this 4.5 times 4.5 times 4, and I'm going to have a, uh, a pressure gradient of almost 82 in this case. You can see here the maximum pressure gradient is 82. So we use simplified Bernoulli equation on everyday basis, for mostly for estimation of RVSP, but aortic stenosis is another great example by which velocities are being transferred into a pressure gradient. Now, other forms of Doppler, we basically gonna touch a base upon uh, pulse wave Doppler, continuous wave Doppler, color Doppler, and um, um, others. So a pulse wave Doppler is basically a short intermittent bursts of ultrasounds. However, what you're doing is that you have a crystal that's sending those ultrasound beams. Remember, ultrasound is all about listening to those reflected beams and generating an image. But what I'm doing in pulse wave Doppler, I'm only listening at a fixed brief time interval. So if, say, for example, I want to listen after one, uh, two milliseconds or 10 milliseconds after I send my uh, uh, um, burst of ultrasound. So what, what that actually helps me, if I know my time interval by which the time the impulse has traveled and went back, I can get the distance. And this is what pulse wave Doppler is great in range resolution. Um, so if I basically, and where do we use pulse wave Doppler and echocardiogram? What, what structure are we interested in to know the exact velocity of that structure? Can you guys give me an example? What's that? Okay, so LVOT, we put a pulse wave Doppler because at that anatomic location in the ventricular outflow tract, I want to know what the velocity profile, what other places we use. Uh... Yes, mitral inflow. So if I want to get my, my early diastolic filling and late diastolic filling, which is the E and the A, I want to know at that exact location what is the velocity profile looks like. So if you can see here, here's a sampling volume that's placed at the mitral valve leaflet tips, and I have an, a bursts of ultrasound from a single crystal that's basically going in and listening after a certain time period, and you're basically going to be able to generate a spectral Doppler showing the E wave, and the A wave. So here what you're seeing is the velocity, the early diastolic velocity, and then the late diastolic velocity at this certain anatomic location, which is at the mitral valve leaflet tips. Now, in contrast to continuous wave Doppler, where you are continuously sending and you are continuously receiving ultrasound signals. So you're actually going to generate a profile that basically looks like you have blood everywhere. So here's your E and A, but I'm actually sampling all the moving red blood cells what's happening beneath this peak velocity. So the pulse wave Doppler, remember, it's very specific for the location that you're imaging, while continuous wave Doppler is not specific for that range because it's gonna sample all the velocity of the moving structures here, 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 here. But obviously it's gonna be highest at the mitral valve leaflet tips. When the valve opens, you have this inflow in early diastole. But remember, continuous wave Doppler is actually, does not give you a range resolution and it's gonna sample all the moving structures during that time period that you have imaged. So here you have an E and an A, and then you have, so this is diastole because it's above the baseline, and here in systole, you have a regurgitation jet, so this is the blood flow that's going out. So you're gonna sample all those lines or moving structures 
uh, during that time period, and it does not specify or give you any anatomic location. Here's a pulse wave Doppler of the abdominal aorta. We always do it, so you can see here there's a nice uprise peak and then downtrend. I'm only looking at this specific anatomical location, a very small sampling volume, a burst of ultrasounds going in, and I'm only listening at that distance. Now, color Doppler is actually a variance of uh, pulse wave Doppler. So what color Doppler um, uh, you're doing, you actually have multiple sampling sites. So if you look at each of those dots, are sampling sites by which you're sending an ultrasound beam to it and listening. But what you did on ECHO almost 30 years ago is that they coded this flow of blood using different colors. So by convention, the blood that's basically flowing towards you is going to be orange or red, and then the blood that's going to be flowing away from you is going to be blue. So blue is away, and anything that's moving towards you is going to be more reddish. And what these are, these are multiple sampling sites of a pulse wave Doppler that you are sending and listening to, and then you have this coding scale that gives you color coding to tell you what the direction of the blood is. Is this blood coming towards me, or is this blood that's going away from me? So here's basically a color wave Doppler, and what you're seeing, here's the, um, the left ventricle, the right ventricle, the right atrium, the left atrium, and if this one plays. So what you can see here, there's a mosaic of color that's going back into the left atrium and systole, and this mosaic is turbulence of flow. And typically, this is what you see in regurgitant jets. While once the mitral valve opens, you're going to have a jet color of orange, meaning that this flow is coming towards the transducer, which is here. And then any blood that's leaving the ventricle out, either to the atrium or to the LV outflow tract, is going to be blue. And whenever you have turbulence, you're going to have this mosaic color. So this was a case of mitral regurgitation seen on color Doppler, and it's basically causing this turbulence of jet flow going back. Because you have blood moving into the mitral valve, so this is going to be orange, and you have blood leaking back, which is going to be blue, and that's why it creates this mosaic color, uh, meaning that there is turbulence of flow in that region. So ECHO over the years have basically undergone a, a tremendous um, a revolution, all the way from amplitude mode to M mode to do, to, to do dimensional images to Doppler, to transesophageal echo, and now all the way to echoes that are basically carried in our pocket uh, with handheld ultrasounds. And this basically um, has been, um, what, they, what, what Dr. Zogby always used to say is that the technology has been there for many years, and all what they have done in order to move from one innovation to the other is just they ask a different question. So if I want to image a moving structure at a high sample on what do I do? If I want to look at the direction of flow, what do I do? So every time you ask a question, but the technique of ultrasound physics has not changed in, in decades. Um, any questions before we move to the standard echo views? And then after that, we'll touch base. Yes? Just a quick one. When you were explaining pulse versus capillary and about like using the micro explosion. Yeah. Well, it just looks like from that waveform that if it's a junior flow, you get all of the same information. And so it's uh, and just, just comparing those two waveforms. Uh, so uh, uh, I guess maybe you could just reiterate the, what is the benefit of the pulse wave if I can get all of the same waveform? So the pulse, the pulse wave will give you a, a range resolution, meaning that in that specific anatomic location, what is the velocity of the moving structures are. So in the setting of, for example, when we do PW at the mitral valve leaflet tips in diastology, I want to know at this specific anatomical location what the velocity is. Remember, in continuous wave Doppler, it's going to give you all the range of the velocities across this whole ultrasound beam. So it does not give you a range resolution, meaning I cannot tell where is this structure or where is this velocity coming from. Now, based on the, as you said, based on the, on the shape, it looks like it's the same, but here you're picking all the moving red blood cells that's happening even before uh, and anything that happens under. Here, you're only looking at the velocity of the, this structure here. You're not looking at the, all the velocity of the moving structure. So number one, if you want to image structures with higher velocities, you need to use continuous wave because it gives you a much wider uh, um, um, uh, re uh, range in terms of picking higher velocities. The problem with pulse wave Doppler is that depending on how many times you're sampling, it's not going to be able to sample velocities that are twice as much as what you're sending. So practically speaking, things will start to wrap up, and we call it aliasing. So pulse wave Doppler is not used for low-velocity signals, while continuous wave Doppler is used for high-velocity signals. 
So if I have mitral speed. regurgitation, in this case, for example, the peak velocity of mitral regurg is like four meters per second five because it depends on the pressure gradient. So pulse wave Doppler will not give you that high uh, um, velocity because unfortunately it's fixed to a single ultrasound beam, single location, and it's at a certain velocity. If it exceeds that velocity, it will start to alias. So. Yeah, I think, I mean, to kind of touch on that, a, a key, key example where this could be useful is if you have subvalvular and valvular stenosis. By pulse wave Doppler, you could see exactly where, you could sample a specific location, subvalvular or valvular. With continuous wave, it will just tell you what the highest velocity is anywhere along that, but it won't localize where it is. So, and that's when the PDOC probe, which is used mainly, it's a continuous wave Doppler. So you get, you pick up the highest velocity, you know, out of all the images, but then the problem is localization again. But in the clinical right context, you, you know which velocity you're picking up with that probe, but you know that it's based on the same principle. So these are the standard echocardiographic views that we always start with, uh, the parasternal. Uh, we basically have the apical, the subcostal, and the suprasternal. And what are the cases that we need to look at the heart from a right parasternal uh, uh, window? Do you guys know a case where which... Because these are, every one of you are familiar with the peristernal long axis, the apical, the subcostal, the suprasternal. When do we have to use a right peristernal? So look at the image or look at the structure here and tell me what condition do you think that we might need to image the heart all the way up from the right side rather than from the left side? Yes, so if you have an aortic stenosis, so remember here's the aortic valve and then the jet flow is going to be accelerating all the way up and then sometimes, believe it or not, the right peristernal window can give you the highest velocity of aortic stenosis because it's right. Remember, the angle of the intercept between the ultrasound beam and the moving structure is critical. As long as you're parallel to the moving structure, you're going to basically have a better uh, velocity profile. So from a peristernal long axis view, uh, as you know, you basically put your probe with the marker aiming towards the left shoulder. And the structures that you're going to be imaging is basically going to be the septum. You're going to see the posterior wall of the left ventricle. You're going to see the aortic valve and basically the proximal portion of the ascending aorta. And practically, you're going to see the anterior mitral valve leaflet, posterior mitral valve leaflet. Here's in systole and here is in diastole. And this is just a tomographic representation of where do you cut the heart when you are acquiring a long axis view that is parasternal. Now, if you want to move from a parasternal long axis view to a short axis view, all what you have to do, basically, you have to turn the probe, and with that, you're actually imaging the cross-section of the heart. So it's a short axis uh, cross-section of the heart. And here, we're imaging far more high up at the aortic valve level. So you see the right cusp, the left cusp, the non-coronary cusp. You see the right ventricular outflow tract, the pulmonic valve. The left atrium is way back. It's the most posterior structure. And then you'll see the right atrium here along with the tricuspid valve. Um, if I want to move from the base of the heart, I want to image a little bit more uh, um, um, inferior, so the base, and then I want to go down to the mitral valve level. So what you do basically is that you tip the probe so that you're not, your beam is not hitting the base of the heart. You want it to kind of aim up. Uh, you aim your probe more higher in order to get a lower uh, cutout. So here basically we're imaging at the mitral valve level. What you see here is a short axis view of the left ventricle. You see here the mitral valve, the anterior leaflet, and the posterior leaflet, beautifully here in systole. Here's the right ventricle, which is an anterior structure, and then here is the anterior wall, inferior wall, lateral wall of the LV. Um, and then as you move down further, so you're basically aiming to image, not the base, now you're imaging the mid and the apex, you'll start seeing the anterolateral and the posterior medial papillary muscles, and then again you see the uh, left-sided structures. Um, moving on to the apical view, so you basically see what your point of maximal impulse is, and you always want to uh, um, aim for the mark to basically aim towards the left shoulder. And what you see here is basically four chambers. So the left ventricle, right ventricle, right atrium, left atrium. And uh, that's basically the cut of the heart that you're imaging all the way from the apex. You're basically getting a long axis view of the heart uh, from the apical windows. Uh, to move on from a four chamber to a two chamber, you rotate 90 degrees, and then basically you're going to be able to say the or see the two chambers of the heart: the left ventricle, the right, the left atrium. And typically, uh, the anterior wall of the heart is going to be here. The inferior wall of the heart is going to be here. And then, as you move further, so you basically rotate another 90 degrees. You're basically getting a three chamber view by which you start opening the aortic valve, the aorta. Here's the left ventricle. The mitral valve is here, and here is the left atrium. <clears throat> 
Um, to move on to an apical five chamber view, you basically want to image a plane by which you're cutting through the base of the heart. So this basically requires you to aim your probe inferiorly. So your ultrasound beam is basically aiming more superior towards the base of the heart. And what you see on this five chamber view, again, LV, RV, RA, LA, but then you basically start noticing the left ventricular outflow tract and the aortic valve. So these are your standard apical views uh, that we always acquire on every patient. Uh, moving afterwards is the subcostal views. Subcostal views is usually life-saving for fellows because if you're still not familiar how to get your, your, your images, almost always you will not miss the subcostal, um, assuming the patient has a decent body size. But it's very reasonable to look for grossly LV function, to look for any grossly effusion. We're going to show you some examples, but this can be life-saving, especially in people who are intubated, sedated, they cannot leave on the, or they cannot lean on their left lateral side. So on the subcostal view, you're going to see the levers here, right ventricle, right atrium, left atrium, left ventricle. And that's basically where you aim uh, uh, your ultrasound probe. And typically, you aim the marker for the uh, left shoulder. And then uh, from a super, for the suprasternal view, you basically see the transverse arch. And you also see the origin of the major vessels. So the brachiocephalic, the left common, and then the um, uh, left subclavian. Um, you're going to see those uh, slides at the fellows boot camps, uh, but common uses of echocardiography is to look for chamber sizes and function. It's gold standard for hypertrophy, for heart failure evaluation, assess valve lesions, effusions, endocarditis. So here's just a little uh, potpourri of uh, what we see on echocardiogram. Here's a patient who has severe left ventricular hypertrophy with what appears to be normal ejection fraction. He has a big atrium on the left side, big atrium on the right side, and also he has severe right ventricular hypertrophy. This is a patient with dialysis. And you can see here on the parasternal long axis view, here's the LV, mitral valve, very severely concentric hypertrophy ventricle. The different uh, uh, cardiomyopathies can be seen very readily with echocardiogram. So here's a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy using uh, uh, contrast agents with uh, um, um, contrast. Here's a patient who has severe uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Here's a patient who appears to have a uh, um, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy with an apical ballooning, and you can basically see the hyperdynamic basal and mid-segments. And here's a patient who has severe biatrial enlargement with what appears to be uh, normal LV ejection fraction but has a restrictive cardiomyopathy. So echo really can help you be the gatekeeper in order to screen any patients for LV systolic or diastolic function. Three-dimensional echo has been around for like over um, a decade or two. And what you do basically, remember, you acquire a volume of data instead of a two-dimensional data. And you're able basically to trace this left ventricular borders in order to generate an automated uh, border definition and basically be able to uh, give them volumes uh, um, instead of using the biplane uh, that we typically use. Strain is basically is a, a special imaging of the heart by which we look at the deformation, so how those fibers are shortening at the endocardial level, and basically uh, this has been studied extensively um, in ECHO for over the past uh, 15 years. Um, using color, color uh, uh, Doppler, uh, as we said, it really helps us assess valvular, and it's key in terms of assessment of valvular, both stenosis and regurgitation. So here's a patient who appears to have severe right ventricular enlargement and hypertrophy, and he has what appears to be right, uh, wide open tricuspid regurgitation, which is uh, the leaflets are very uh, restricted, and he has all this mosaic of color flowing back into his right atrium, causing, um, um, or as a cause of his tricuspid regurg. Here's a patient using a, a three-dimensional uh, TEE, rheumatic mitral valve disease. So you basically can see the commissural fusion. Here's the aortic valve. You have this fish mouth appearing of the mitral valve on 3D and also on 2D. You can basically see the thickness of those mitral valve leaflets with a very fixed posterior leaflet. So 2D, 2D echo basically uh, can help you with that. And now with machine learning, you're able to generate models for like the mitral valve and the aortic valve. This is a, a Siemens um, software that using 3D data from your transoft gel echo, it's actually able to get you real-time uh, images of the mitral valve in systole and in diastole, and then the aortic valve also. And you can also see the origins of the coronary heights. Uh, pericardial disease is actually um, echocardiogram is the first line imaging diagnostic modality. You see this patient who has a typical shuddering uh, of their ventricular septum, what we call the diastolic septal bounce. Um, and here's a patient who has large, massive pericardial effusion with uh, diastolic collapse consistent with tamponade from an apical view. And 
And here's the patient who has severe left ventricular enlargement and he has a large uh, mobile thrombus uh, in his left ventricle. Um, so that's it for the lecture. Uh, just back to the, uh, um, to the questions. Uh, I think you guys, uh, so which one was the least accurate? Most of you really got this right, but anyone wants to sh um, speak up the least accurate uh, regarding the interaction of ultrasound and tissue? Is it A, B, C, or D? D? Okay, yeah, D is the right answer. So why is that? Because remember, as the ultrasound waves are basically traveling, so number one, attenuation is weakness of those ultrasound waves. So it can weaken the, the further the image is, but it actually plays so much attention to, or it actually pays a big factor to the tissue type. If you remember, the velocity of ultrasound, it varies by the tissue that you're imaging. So if it's going fast through bone, it's actually going very slow through air. So the tissue type actually makes your image can look much attenuated or less based on that. And that's why this is the least accurate among all of these. All the others are actually true. So we said that the lower the frequency of the ultrasound, you're going to have much better penetration, but unfortunately your resolution is not going to be as good. And then the higher the frequency, your resolution is going to be better. So this is true. And then the first statement is also true. If I have a sh much shorter wavelength, I'm going to be able to discriminate much smaller structures, which means that my spatial resolution is going to be better. Uh, and which one of the following of these was true? Uh, was it the first or the second or the third? So what are the components of the Doppler equation? If one thing that you're going to take home, take home from this uh, uh, conference is actually the Doppler equation, because you're going to be asked about it on the board. It's going to be with you for the rest of your life. So remind us, what are the components of the Doppler equation? Um, Okay, so the velocity of the moving structure. Okay, that's one. The area. Okay, so that's the, yep. So the velocity of the sound in the medium. And then the third one was? The frequency, okay. Exactly, so basically the angle. So uh, the first, um, so this is not true because here we're only talking about the original frequency and the velocity of the ultrasound through the medium and the velocity of the reflector, it doesn't take into account um, uh, the angle. So that's why the first one is not accurate. Now, the continuous wave Doppler allows you to monitor the depth of your target. I think we talked about it. Does it or does not? Are you able to tell where you're imaging using a continuous wave Doppler? No, because unfortunately, you have this crystal that's sending ultrasound uh, um, bursts of ultrasound waves all the time, and it's actually sampling through all that path. So really the correct answer here is the last one, which is color Doppler is based on pulse wave Doppler, but using different sampling points and using different uh, color uh, coding in order to tell the direction of flow. Questions? There is a lot more to know in physics, but I really try to hammer the things that are kind of low-hanging fruit and things that are not super boring, but there's a lot of equations and a lot of physics, but I really try to keep it user-friendly as possible. And uh, Bindu is going to touch uh, more upon transits of GLECO next time, which I think is more relevant than artifacts, um, especially for our first-year fellows. And, uh, and the shared drive is on OneDrive. Every one of you should have access to it. So this lecture and hopefully all the other attendings, basically, they upload their lectures. So you all have it available. And every year, people can, if we hear feedback, we can always adjust and add stuff or remove stuff accordingly. So these all should be available for you guys. Yes. Yeah. But it, but it really aliases because of the velocity exceeds the Nyquist limit, right? Exactly, Which is yes. usually in turbulent flow, but not always. Right? Yes. So uh, not necessarily a turbulent flow. If you have a high velocity, just so you have a hyperdynamic yeah. ventricle, your velocity across the LV outflow tract is like 1.6 or 1.5, it's going to start to alias. I didn't go to the Nyquist limit issue yeah, because yeah. I thought it might be a little bit too much <laughs> yeah, yeah. to cover, and I had to cover a lot of stuff in a short time. But yes. What you're doing is you're basically exceeding this pulse 
uh, frequency. So the time that you're sending and receiving, it has to basically be doubled, and that's why the Nyquist limit is typically half of what you send and receive. So if it exceeds that, then yes, you're basically gonna uh, start to wrap around, and that's what you see, velocity above and below the baseline. So the regular Bernoulli equation is V2 square minus V1 square. We are ignoring the V1 square where the proximal velocity is negligible. But in situations where the proximal velocity is high, or usually we say cutoff of 1.5, then you want to use the proximal velocity, so you actually have to use the V2 square minus V1 square. That's one exception which is very important to know. And in the rest of the cases, you can definitely use the simplified you know, Bernoulli equation, which is basically the 4V2 square. Okay, any other questions? Sounds good, thank you all.